Hey, welcome to the movie where we're going to actually drill a hole. It sounds pretty simple, but to do it right, you have to follow quite a few steps. Because once you drill a hole in the wrong location, it's hard to put that material back into the hole. It's kind of like Humpty Dumpty. Anyway, in this movie, we're going to check the location of our origin before we get started. In a previous movie, we used the edge finder to define the left edge of the part to be x equal to 0 and the back edge to be y equal to 0. Once we have our origin established, we're going to manually move the, uh, the table and the saddle so that we're at the correct hole position. Then we're going to check this position with our caliper. Then we're ready to do a center drill, which is going to be a small hole that's going to guide our drill into the correct direction and location. Then we're going to do the drilling. And then finally, we're going to clean that hole up with a nice countersink. So let's talk about how we go about checking the location of an origin. So here we go with Don Howard again. All right, so Don is going to now check the zero. So Don, could you go over the procedure on how we're going to check zero? All right, yeah, the prototrack gives us an option to be able to check our x, y, zero. So we can hit return to a, b, s, zero. That's absolute zero. So I can hit this soft key, F6. And it tells me, ready to begin, press go when ready. Well, in my experience is whenever we press go, that means the machine's going to run uh, a rapid move somewhere so or feed. You want to make sure your Z is up out of the way. And we're not really sure what's going to happen here. Uh, we think it might move. It may not. But So if we hit go, nothing happened. We look up here. It's, now it's telling us to check Z. All right. We make sure Z is up out of the way. And we press go. Once it moves, did you get that? Set this up, and we can bring it down, and we can recognize, we can look down both axes, and we see that the center of the spindle is, in fact, over the edges of my part. All right, so that just moved us automatically to x0, y0, but Don, I still see z minus 0.75. Well, it doesn't do the automatic move to z? No, the z is not automatic. It's strictly manual. And Don has brought the, the spindle up so that as it moved in the X and Y, it didn't run into the part and, and ruin the edge finder. That is correct. Okay. All right. So you move that uh, spindle upward before you ever do that thing called return absolute zero. And remember, there's, there's notices on the screen in green, and I believe green means go, something's going to move. Is that? Yeah, it's a good indication something's going to happen. So when something's going to move, we don't want it to run into anything. All right, so we've got zero. Right now, it's in the corner of the part. So I, I presume, Don, that that corner, that back left corner, is zero. That is correct. All right. He said that is correct. I feel so proud of myself that I am learning from Don. Let's go over the steps that Don went over in checking the lo location of our origin. Now, first off, before you do any of this, you have to use your quill or the knee of the machine and make sure that the height of the bottom of the tool is above the part because when we do this operation of moving to the origin it's going to be an automated motion and it's a power feed so if the if the tool is down below the the, uh, the part or the vise or something and you start to move something's going to snap all right so when you have your part below the bottom of your tool you then can go to the DRO and press the following buttons. You're going to hit the return to ABS0. Now, that's one of the menu items at the bottom of the screen, and that co corresponds with the F6 key. So you press that. There's going to be a message on the screen at that point to say, check to make sure your Z is correct. Now, Z is your up and down. And what the, what the DRO is trying to tell you there is you need to check to make sure your tool is out of the way. After you do that, you can hit the feed go button. And then the, um, the saddle and the table should automatically move to the x equal to 0, y equal to 0 location. Now, that's going to be their, our origin. Now, if everything's correct, that spindle should now be centered up on the back left corner of the part. So if it looks good, we're ready to proceed to the next operation, which is going to be checking our whole position. And we're going to look at this diagram a little bit more later.
So, Don, let's say uh, you have to decide before you drill a hole, it's kind of like before you go somewhere, you have to know where it is you want to go, right? Because if you ask someone directions and they ask you, well, where do you want to go, and you have the answer, I don't know, then I guess it doesn't matter. Just like with a hole, you need to know on your blueprint or whatever where it is you want to put this. Um, you don't have a blueprint, so are you going to just specify something ahead of time? Yes, we're gonna, I'm going to do a couple holes for you today. Uh, one is I'll hand move it. And uh, I'll show you how to get there. We'll go quarter by quarter. All right. All right. But do you have specified from the zero zero point where are you going to want it? Like, kind of toward the middle or two inches in? I, I want to just have something that we're shooting for, because uh, otherwise Don's just going to drill and say, "Yeah, that's where I want it all the time." All right. I'll do a. I, I did say a quarter by quarter, so I'll go one inch by one inch. All right, so he wants a hole that's one inch uh, in on the X and one inch from the Y. Uh, are we going to interfere with that hole? Should we get out our... our, our should we get out our verniers and check. Okay, uh, is this a place where we could just use our... our okay, what's half by half? One half inch by one half inch. One half inch. Oh, we're not going to go very far at all. No. Okay. Do I have to worry that we're going to hit the parallel? Uh, depending on the size of your drill... You'd have to take that in consideration, but I've chosen to drill about a quarter of an inch, so uh, we shouldn't hit. All right. So he's going to come in a half, over a half. He's cranking the things. Don is moving this thing in an unprescribed way. I don't know what he's doing. Oh, there it is. Minus 0.5. Okay, because he's moved the spindle. Now, the spindle doesn't actually move, but relative to the part, the part sees a spindle. You know, if you're in the reference plane of the part, uh, you're going to see a spindle moving to the, in the negative y direction. Okay, and likewise, if you're in the reference frame of the part and you move the spindle toward me, that would be, you would be seeing a spindle moving in the positive x. That's correct. You've got it. Okay, so we're moving, he moved to, to uh, y, negative 0.5, okay, that way, and now he's going to move x to positive 0.5. Okay. I went past, so now I'm going to take out backlash. If you notice before, I went past my 500 mark, so now I'm going to back it up. This is where we take out backlash. You back up past the half inch, and you creep back up to 0.5. Okay, so let me just review that idea. If you're moving to a, to a location and spinning the wheel this way and you go past it, you don't just bring it back. You have to bring it past a little bit more extra and then come up to it. So you always want to be coming up to a measurement, turning this wheel in the same direction. Yes, okay. very important to do. All right, and this is about how the... Um, the uh, the threads in the screws are are engaging. Okay, so very important. Uh, this is what's what makes him a master uh, toolmaker and me just a, a bumbling idiot here. Um, Don, you don't have it right on point five. Is, should I worry about this five tenths of a thousand? Uh, for this example, no. Uh, there may be a chance where you may have to worry about it. Uh, five tenths on a machine like this. An engineering student would be doing pretty good for themselves if they located this close? Yes. All right. So we're in the correct spindle location. So we're trying to find out if we're in the correct position to drill our hole. In this previous example, Don said that we wanted to be a half inch in from the left and a half inch in from the back, and we were going to uh, put our hole in that location. And you can see this little circle. So that's where we were intending to put it. Now what Don did was he used the manual handles on the table and the saddle to move to that location. And he said, it's always important to always be turning the handles to your final location in the same direction always. So if you're moving things, let's say, so that your values of x are increasing in the positive direction, and let's say you go past the 0.5, you don't want to turn in the opposite direction to get to 0.5. You have to turn in the opposite direction further. You have to go past it uh, and then turn so that you're moving in the positive direction. And that's because there's some 
something called backlash in the threads of uh, the feeds. So uh, if you turn the manual feed one way, uh, there's going to be a little play one way. If you put it the other way, the other way. So the important thing is always move to your final position, turning the handles in the same direction. Now let's go back to our uh, a diagram up here. The origin has been established in the back left corner. Positive Y is uh, to the top of the page and positive X to the right. So if 0, 0, X0, zero, Y0 zero is this back left edge, then if we want our hole to be here, we're moving in the positive X direction, so our coordinate is plus 0.5, but we're below or in the negative y direction, so we're going to have to move to negative uh, 0.5 in the y direction. All right, so every bit of our part is going to be in the negative y direction, and every bit of our part is going to be in the positive x. So that's getting to our correct hole position. Next, once we're at that position, we want to be able to check it, and Don's going to cover that in this next slide. Now Don has two things in his hand. Uh, if I pick the correct one I get a trip to Hawaii. Is that No that's not true. Alright Don what, what, what are these two things? Do they do essentially the same thing? What's their names? One is a spa drill and one is a center drill. Alright they basically do the same thing. We're going to use them to um, spot a hole. Alright uh, give it a location and uh, give it a spot place for the drill to enter and uh, locately, uh, accurately locate its position. Okay. So you don't want to just start with the drill because there's no place to kind of guide the drill into the part and it could, could, it, could, we, could I use that word walk? Yes. The so drill could walk across the top of your part. Now most people who are using let's say a DeWalt drill are never worrying about walking but we're talking about precision machining where we're going to want to be precision to within maybe five thousandth of an inch right so this could be important. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right so this uh, center drill real important operation. So Don has chose to use the center drill um, I think because uh, they're, they're, that's what might be used by your instructor but if your instructor pulls out a spot drill uh, there's this a good reason for that one probably too. Alright so he's put that in the chuck he's using a chuck key and he's tightening that up and now he has his uh, center drill in there. Now he's using the quill handle and coming down and he just touched something there. Okay now Don you didn't drill anywhere but I see you made a little mark. Why didn't you just go and plunge ahead? This is the other option uh, that I talk about a lot. Um, to verify that my x, y, zero is correct. So I come down and I do a slight little prick punch. Uh, if I'm off 100 thousands, I'm going to see it. Okay. So is this the idea, measure twice or three times and then maybe cut once? That's exact. Okay. All right, just remember, folks, you can always take material away from a part. You cannot add material to a part. Uh, unless you're a master craftsman, because Don has ways of filling in holes, but it's a very complex comp uh, operation. So now Don has made the prick point. He's bringing out uh, his caliper, and I see 0 0.50, well, he's pretty close. He's, that's 0.495, so he's within five thousandths of an inch there, and on the X, about the same so yeah it's okay so you can see the little pick he, he showed it okay there's some all right okay so now keep in mind we now have a we now have a sharp in there that's very very sharp so when you're doing this measurement you want to be very careful not to move your hand into the sharp uh, cutting surface. Let's look at the procedures for checking that whole position. So our intended position was one half inch from the left side in and one half inch uh, toward us from the back edge. So first thing we do is we're going to move the cranks to positive 0.5, always moving the cranks in the same direction to get to the final location. Move to y equal minus 5.5. .5. Then we're going to install the center drill 
and we're going to use the center drill just, just to make a little prick in the surface. So this is just a cosmetic thing. You don't want to go very far. Then you turn off the spindle and well preferably you would move the saddle and so forth away but in this case since we want to immediately then uh, use the center drill we're not going to do that we're just going to be very very careful in our measurement and not have our hand uh, go against the center drill so you use your caliper confirm that you're at the actual correct location next up we're ready to do the actual center drilling let's go back to Don all right Don before you turn that on you're going to plunge this into the part, but how far are we going to go with that? Uh, being that this is just a spot, I'm using this as center drill, I'm going to go two-thirds the large diameter of it, just so that I can guide my drill. Two-thirds the large diameter. Is this the large diameter, what I see the up there? The large diameter of the, oh. yes, of the taper. Oh, the large, the, lar the large diameter. So we're going to go, we're not going to go all the way up we're just going to go up two thirds of, of that the, little one of that large taper of the taper. All right. Well, when you come down to it, Jason, you uh, make sure that that you zoom in so we see what two thirds looks like. Because I I'm I'm clueless right now what that means. All right. All right. Well, a couple things I want to say before we continue is you need to pay attention to this pilot size. If you got a drill uh, that's smaller than that, you've just ruined your hole. All right, uh, if this pilot is larger than your drill that you're using. So you're going to have to pay attention to this diameter here, all right? And you want to pay attention that sometimes uh, you're going to have to pay attention. Uh, Two-thirds is just a rule of thumb. Uh, you don't want to counter, go down and basically countersink deeper than the thickness of your part. Uh, so you got to use... So you don't want to make too large a hole here is what I think Don's getting to. So he's taking the lock off and he's coming down. He's doing peck drilling operation little by little. He's going down. He's going down. Now the little part of the center drill seems to be all the way down into the hole right now. And now Don is stopping this part. All right. So Jason, why don't you come in. So two-thirds. Uh, Don, what do you mean by two-thirds? I'm like sorry. Take, up, take a look at this angled surface, oh. this angled edge, and divide it up into thirds. I'm going to go up two-thirds of that taper. Oh, okay. Okay. So you don't, you, you still want some taper above the hole. Right. Uh, so you just want to go to like the two-thirds mark. I got it. Two-thirds up the taper. Yes. Okay. Yep. Now I got it. So there's a little hole. Um, and that's, is that all we have to do, or do we now, okay, we're going to take this out? Yeah, I'm going to take the center drill out, and I'll put the drill in. All right. Let's review that center drilling operation. You can use either a center drill or a spot drill. It'll be up to your lab instructor to determine which to use. If using the center drill like we did here, the depth of the hole, or the depth that we want to plunge the uh, center drill in, is two-thirds up the taper of the center drill. And I'm going to show what that means on the next slide. The, uh, the diameter of your pilot of your center drill okay, should be or has to be less than the, the diameter of the drill you're going to ultimately be using. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose of uh, what the center drill hole is, which is just to guide the drill. You have to always be careful of sharp surfaces. And remember, in a drilling operation or a milling operation, there's a lot of friction. So there's going to be a lot of heat generated. So although something like the center drill might not look hot, it could be very, very hot. So you need to be very careful. Probably think about using uh, a cloth or rag to, to hold it. All right, the center drilling depth, because I was confused in the, the movie, uh, what he meant by two-thirds up to taper was, you know, this slanted surface, this cutting surface here, is, uh, let's call that L. We'd want to uh, plunge this drill, the center drill, down into the material until we get to approximately this two-thirds mark. Now, that's not an exact location that we're going to have to measure, but just uh, this is going to be a rough eyeball. Now, Don said that this bottom part called the pilot, uh, which actually starts the hole, you have to make sure that that 
is uh, is definitely a smaller diameter than the diameter of uh, of your drill. Otherwise, this uh, center drill hole will be too large and not guide the drill properly. We're ready to now do the drilling. Let's see what Don does here. So go ahead and uh, do that at your leisure, Don. Is there any surfaces on the center drill I have to be careful not to touch? Well, they're going to be sharp, so I'm going to grab it by the shank. You want to be careful here, and if you get just get done drilling, it may be warm, so you want to be careful of touching the tip. Oh, we forget that. During machining operations, there's a lot of friction between part on part. Things can get hot, and, and you don't look at them and think they're hot, but they can be very hot. All right, uh, now you're going to put this drill in. What size drill? Quarter inch. It's a quarter inch drill. Uh, now, Don, we have to always be aware, and I'm going to move over onto this side. Like you said, we don't want to drill down into the vise or into the parallels. Um, how do? So you're going to put this in, but right now I can't see how you're going to get it in. All right. If you notice, I did not crank my knee down far enough. All I did is had enough room for my edge finder and my center drill. So now what I have to do is crank this down. My recommendations is before you get started, you should always take and look and see if you're doing a lot of precision work. You don't want to have to crank this knee up and down, so you want to get this to the point where you can slip your drills in and out uh, easily during the operation. So you want to make sure you get proper clearance ahead of time. So now I have to crank my knee down. Now why not just put the quill up, or is the quill up as far as it can go? Quill is up. Okay. All right, so we're bringing the, the knee down with the, I don't know, the knee handle? Vertical Vertical. Vertical traverse crank. Wow, don't you sound uh, smart, Don. Okay, so so he's he's got some clearance at the bottom of the drill so he can get it out. I can get it out, Don, if I loosen this? Yeah. I don't believe it. You can get it out. Let's see. Oh, but you had to take it to the side. So you should... All right. So there's nothing precise about exactly. You just want to make it so you can easily get your drill in. Okay. So hand tightening the the chuck, using the chuck key. All right. Now this is something I, I I'm familiar with. This is a drill. I've seen these things before. All right. All right. The other thing is you guys will want to take a think about your spindle speeds. Uh, you use your f sp uh, spindle RPM formula which is four times the cutting speed divided by the diameter. Yeah, 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 we got it. So the diameter is a quarter. So if I have divide by a quarter in the diameter, it's like multiply by four. So four times cutting speed divided by a quarter really is like 16 times my cutting speed. Because right. I have four and then a quarter in the denominator. So it's, I think I'm good on this one. 16 times cutting speed. Go for it. So, so, so what's the cutting speed of uh, of of this? This is like two two hundred. Sixteen times two hundred is three thousand two hundred. Does that sound like a reasonable th number? Yes, but in manual operations, you won't run that fast. All right. So these formulas give you a rough guideline, but experience of your instructor and the operations that you're doing and, and your skill level is going to trump what the, the formula says. Yes. Okay. So he has to turn on the spindle and he's going to put it not to what I just calculated which was 3200. He's going only to about 1800. Now Jason can't see what you're doing there. Okay now he can. So Don is going a little ways. Don, do we have to use any oil or anything when we're doing this? We should, but I'm pecking a little bit more so I don't have to dirty up my machine. Uh, coolant's uh, of a friend of yours. You should get used to using it. It helps extend tool life. It helps give you a better finish in your part. Um, and it also helps keep the part cool. Now I see chips hanging from there. I never want to put my hand in there. I would use a chip brush, which uh, I'm looking for. Right up here? All right, yep, I got the chip brush. So Don, here's the chip brush. You would maybe use the chip brush. And uh, so I presume we don't have any of this cutting oil. 
<laughs> so hold on. Don, I, I always get Don. All right. We told you that you should be using some cutting oil. Uh, this is also helps aid in the cooling process. The cooling, it lubri uh, lubricates um, and it helps keep the chip clear. So it will help cool. And I promise, Don, I will do the cleanup. <laughs> now, uh, so did you go all the way through, Don? Yes. How far down? Now, th that's the other thing. You don't want to go so far down that you hit the bottom of the vice. Well, you don't want to hit the bottom of your vice, no. So as soon so, as you break through, you should feel it. You should break through, uh, but you want to go at least so that it's not just the tip that goes through. That's correct. You want the body of the drill to go through. And that would be the part that has a full diameter on it. Okay, so you've got a hole done down there, uh, precisely at half inch uh, in and half inch over. Uh, anything else we need to do on a basic hole operation? Uh, you may want to deburr that hole, so, or maybe you need to tap the hole, or you may need to ream the hole, or you may need to uh, counterbore the hole. So at this point, you could do that. Today, we're just going to countersink. All right, is that a standard operation, Don, a, a countersink? You, is that a generally a good shot practice on, a, on a just a regular hole? Yes. Okay. All right, the drilling operation went pretty quickly, but there's some things we have to keep in mind. You should set your cutting speed to four times, or your, your spindle speed to four times the cutting speed divided by diameter. Now, in this operation, the cutting speed for aluminum was about 200, uh, so four times 200 was 800 and then the diameter of our drill was one quarter so if you took uh, 800 and divided by one fourth you get uh, 3200. Don looked at that calculation and from his own experience said no that's too much and he lowered that I think a little bit over a thousand rpms. So you might have to ask your uh, lab instructor what is the proper uh, rpm for your particular drilling operation. You want to make sure you use coolant. Uh, that's going to be a special oil that will lubricate and help take heat away. Uh, Don was a little reluctant to use it here because he didn't want to clean, but uh, you should not uh, be reticent about using uh, coolant. You should always be using it for drilled holes. Don used a packing uh, operation where the drill was plunged down a, sh a short distance and then pulled back out, and you do that repeatedly inward and then pull it out okay uh, you don't want to try to just dra put you know try to push a drill right straight through because the pecking operation it's helping clean out the chips that are being created in the hole so make sure you use a peck uh, drill operation and then if chips and material gets clogged up on the drill or gets in the way of your operation you to use a chip brush you are never never to put your hand near a spinning tool, drill, or anything. And finally, you have to make sure that the entire taper of the bottom of the drill uh, goes past the bottom of the part. Uh, that was a little unclear to me, so I made a diagram here. Uh, so if you're drilling all the way through, uh, here's the bottom or the top edge of the taper, and then the rest is the full diameter of the drill. So you want to make sure that this dotted line, that, that location, makes it correct all the way through. You don't want to go through and just have just the tip of the drill go through, or else uh, you obviously won't have the full diameter uh, of the hole at the bottom of the part. Our last thing to do is a countersink, so let's see how that operation uh, works and why we do it. So Don's going to pick up uh, the last cutting tool we're going to use today, and I believe this is called a countersink. All right, and he put that into the chuck. I don't know how far you jam it up there, Don. Is, there, is that important? Um, see, you do all these things so fast because you've done them a million times, but to myself, or an engineering student, that's what looks good. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to hold on to the very tip of it because it'll wobble. You want to have the majority of your shank up into your tool holder. But most of these tools will come with a radius, so you don't want to jam them right up into the jaws or you'll still get wobble out of them. So you want to grab a hold of the majority of the shank of the tool. You just don't want to hang on the very end and you don't want to bury it in a, in a drill chuck in such a way that it's grabbing the radiuses or the corners. All righty, Don. So now, 
since we haven't moved anything, we know that this spindle is still at half an inch by half an inch over half an inch up, and we we well we I guess we have to move it back a little bit because uh, we moved some things, bumped it. Okay, so now we're we're back where we need to go. How deep are we going to go? Is this another one of those two thirds steel? No, you only want to do about ten percent of the hole. You just want to clean up maybe fifteen thousandths per side uh, of a of a surface here you're going to want to see. All right, so this is kind of not a precise operation, but something more by feel. Um, for a deburring operation, yeah, it's a look feel type thing. Um, if I was uh, doing it mathematically, I would take 10% of the hole and then calculate the depth in. So to put some kind of uh, precision chamfer on here, there's formulas you use to, to get that. For, for engineering students, we're just using this. Now, you said to deburr. What does that mean? Take the sharp edge off and take any burrs that may have raised up off the surface. If you put your finger on here, you might find that you'll get a real sharp edge, and that edge will be raised. So that's considered a raised edge would be considered a burr. Okay. All right, we're going to keep the same speed. No, I just lowered it to... To low range, uh, your countersinks you're going to want to run slow, um, about probably a third of whatever your spindle speed is. Uh, so I start by just lowering it right down to uh, uh, low range. I want to say back gears all the time because that's the way it was raised. All right, and now pay attention. I just switched this back the other direction. Yeah, wait a minute, Don. You're on two. And here's the first opportunity. I pay attention to which ro way your tool's rotating. It's oh, wait a minute. Can I just turn this off for a second? Yeah. Because, Don, previously, and you can see this, Jason, one was for cl clockwise rotation, for cutting, mm -hmm. all right? And now, two is. You did something. Yeah, I did something. I put it in low range. Oh, so low range, <laughs> two, for this particular, particular machine, two on low range is this way. Now, what if you run a cutting tool like this the wrong way? Is there any harm? Yeah, you're going to roll the cutting edge over. Um, depending on the type of tool, you will cause more damage. Uh, or if it was a CNC, it'll just want to, it don't know, it's going the wrong way. And it'll just jam and ruin parts. It'll put a heck of a burr on your part. So it's going to ruin your part. Will it do any damage to the tool? Possibility is good that you'll dull the tool. You're going to dull the tool. All right. So you want to always, now if you're not sure, Don, you talked about this thing, a quick, what do you call it, a quick on off quick jog I turn it on and I see I'm going the right direction so if I went to the one I can see that's the wrong direction all right if you're not sure what the correct direction is make sure you call your instructor over all right so let's uh, let's go ahead Don you can put it on two you have it on the low range what about what speed was this on about now about about 220. Okay, you can see it's not going too fast. Now, make, before you do that, Don, hold on. Let's make sure Jason can see. Maybe from this angle over here, Jason. Why don't you? You got it from here? Okay. So Don's coming down slowly. All right. Uh, now Don went back up, and I don't know why. It's spring loaded. It's spring loaded. Okay. Okay. So now he's coming in and just kind of. Until he's touching that part, I. So he just cut a little bit of chip there. All right, so he's at minus 0.255, and now he's going down to 0.256. So he went down about ten thousandths of an inch. That is correct. So he brings it down. So in, in case someone's not experienced on it and doesn't know what the right look is. They would come down, they would just start seeing the chips form, mm -hmm. they would look at their Z, right. and... About 10, ten thousands more, 10, thousand. 10 to 15. Now, could they move it to that location and zero it, and then they could see that they're coming? You don't want to do that. Yeah, but trying to coordinate everything. Okay. All right. So, Jason, can you come in and, and uh, I'm just going to turn the machine off here and just show them what a deburred edge would look like. Can you get that pretty good? So it just has a, a little uh, taper. Now, what is the angle on that cutter? This particular cutter is 82 degrees. 82 degrees. So the angle on that chamfer would be half of 82? Yes, 41. 
41 degrees. Now there are some others uh, of these counter sinks that would be 90 degrees? They have 90 degrees. They also have uh, 60 degrees. Okay. So there we have it. We have located a, a precise center of a hole using the edge finder. Um, we've center drilled to, to create a guide so that the drill would not walk. And then we finished up uh, with this countersink and uh, you've done a beautiful job. The countersinking operation is to just clean up the top edge of the hole. All right, so what I've shown here is the top view and then the front section view. All right, so the section view is this as if I cut this part right in half on the bandsaw, and this is what you'd see on the interior, and these hash marks or these uh, diagonal lines show where material was cut. So this uh, inside surface here is the hole, and then you can see the taper that was created by the countersink. Now in the top view, the countersink will have created a larger circle than the circle for the through hole. All right. Now, the countersink diameter should be about 10% greater than the hole diameter. And there's ways of calculating how far you plunge things down. Um, but for this operation, where all we care about is taking off the sharp edges, uh, you're going to probably just eyeball this. The other thing is you're using a much lower RPM on a countersinking operation. And in this case, uh, Don chose 200 RPM. Now to do that, he had to first turn the machine off, put the, the high-low range into low. You have to turn the spindle, make sure it's engaged, then turn the machine back on and dial it to 200 RPM. But something strange happened here when we did that. The spindle turns in the opposite direction in the low range. So that button, that, that on-off spindle button that used to go to 1 to create clockwise now had to go to 2. So always be aware of which way your spindle is going and don't be afraid to quickly jog it on and off uh, so that you can easily um, identify that it is indeed going in a clockwise direction. Uh, putting cut cutting tools in the wrong direction and putting them into parts dulls the tools or could potentially damage them. You're now ready to move into the drilling with manual feed questions. So let's test yourself. Number one, where should the origin be in relation to the part? If we've done our edge finding and everything correctly, where should that origin be? And then list the steps for using the power feed on the DRO to move the spindle automatically to the origin. Two says, list the steps for checking that the hole location is correct before drilling. Three, use a diagram to show how far a center drill should be inserted into a part. Four, list the steps for properly drilling a hole. And the last one, what was the purpose of the countersink operation in this movie? How large should the circle on the top of the part be after this operation is completed? Thanks for coming to this movie. We just have a few more, so stay tuned.